Okay, uh, this next speaker, uh, hugely dynamic. He's also going to be doing a book signing of his, of his book uh, called Charlie, Charlie Fink's Metaverse. Uh, so that's going to be over at the Arcave at 3 o'clock, so make sure you check that out. Uh, so let me please introduce uh, Charlie Fink on stage for you guys. Okay. Hey, hello, Vancouver! <laughs> Well, it's great to be here with you this afternoon. Thank you for making time for me. I know we have a lot of competition next door uh, from uh, some fantastic exhibitors, uh, which give us all a sort of wide view of what's going on in AR and VR. And I'm going to try and do the same thing in 20 minutes. Uh, I wrote a book on AR and VR. Um, it's an AR-enabled guide. I'll show you how that works in a minute. And, um, and yes, I'm signing that book. and, and um, at the Arcave, uh, Why Dreams, the company behind Arcave, is uh, doing a sponsored signing, and that means free $50 books for you, and they're AR enabled. So I've seen a lot of disruption in my lifetime. I'm kind of um, uh, not new at this. I've been in uh, media and entertainment for 35 years, and I've seen a lot of, like most people my age, which are sort of late boomers, I would say, I have seen a lot of disruption, right? The first tape recorder came out when I was a kid, right? So the idea that you could tape music was revolutionary, right? There were three channels on TV. I know you guys hear all this from your parents, so I won't bore you with that, but I got to see a lot of this disruption from inside of big companies. I started my career at Disney as an entertainment executive. I've always loved the entertainment uh, business, and I went back to it as a producer after I made a lot of money as an early executive at AOL. But the last thing I did at Disney was I ran a company called Virtual World Entertainment, and we did something called cab-based simulation. And we built VR arcades for our simulators, uh, and we built 33 of them before things started to go downhill. Uh, and, um, and I got to escape to AOL, where uh, I saw the beginning of the internet revolution, uh, which was pretty amazing. I like to say I got paid at AOL for what I did at Disney. So um, this is some of what I've been up to. But uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, a fr I decided I wasn't going to produce any more Broadway shows because producing a Broadway show is a really shitty job. So I made up a better job for myself. Uh, I write about AR and VR. I have a popular column in Forbes. I've written a book about it. I do consulting, and I speak all over the world about the topic. And I view this subject through what I call my personal filter. These are things that I know are true, and I'll bet you do too. First of all, uh, technology succeeds when it makes what we're already doing better and faster and cheaper. The next thing, which you also know, is that people are the killer app. You walk around with, we walk around with a very powerful computer in our pockets, and 95% of the time, we are interacting with other people. Social media, messaging, which is the iPhone's most popular app, even old-fashioned email. And then the other thing, from my old guy perspective, is that things take a lot longer than people think. Right? I am bullish on AR and head-mounted displays, but I also think it's going to take a decade to happen. It took the personal computer 20 years to be in 25% of American homes. In fact, it wasn't until the computer met online services that people had any idea why they would want one at home. They had one at work. So let's uh, get back to the subject at hand and my book. Um, how does an error book work? It's very simple. You download the free Think Metaverse app, and you point it at the cover. And I'm going to show you what happens when you do that. I hope they're ready to run video sound back there. The Cracker Jack tech team who have done a fantastic job. Uh, so let's see if it works. Hello, I'm Charlie Fink. I'm a futurist and the author of this book, which you can judge from its cover. It's full of AR fun like this. So keep your phone handy as you check out what's inside and join me on this journey. Let's dive in. <laughs> let's have some fun. So <clears throat> you see that through your phone uh, as you hold it over the book. And there are 35 augmentations in the book, a lot of funny cartoons, um, you know, because you can take the boy out of Disney, but you can't take the Disney out of the boy. So 
uh, I learned a few things writing the book. Um, yeah, can we shut the door back there? I think somebody's having a concert. Um, four things I learned writing this book, I sort of knew them, but I, uh, they, they really came home to me. Um, one is this idea that the camera is now the interface, right? The app's not going to be the interface. The camera is going to be the way we see the world and the way digital content lives in the world. And the camera will be clickable, right? The camera will be a search engine. Oops. Um, there are fundamental differences between VR and AR. They are not the same. They have been wrongly conflated because they use similar technologies, but they, I do not believe that they exist on a spectrum. I think the, the Microsoft mixed reality spectrum and the Milgram spectrum, which is from the early 90s, are, are, uh, do not get it right. I'll get into that in a second. Um, but we, are, we have an evolutionary change in computing upon us, right? We are headed toward a world Perhaps it is the world my grandchildren will see. I like to say I am planting a tree under whose shade I shall never sit. But my grandchildren and your grandchildren are going to live in a world of uh, ubiquitous, invisible, contextual computing. And then finally, uh, what does that mean, the ubiquitous uh, contextual computing? It means that here in the world and here in this room and, and every humble object and every person and every place and everything is going to have a detectable layer of data. And that's starting to happen now on our smartphones. But let me back up to this idea that AR and VR are not the same and I think this is a very fundamental concept in the book. Let's start with AR. AR is a club. AR is a tool. And by the way, AR as a tool is the way AR is really making money today. It's not on mobile phones, it's in enterprise. And we'll, we'll talk about that more too, but it's like the steam engine, like the car. It is a tool that takes what we're doing, the work we do, the things we study, and it makes them better. It's a tool. VR, on the other hand, um, has spiritual roots. Right? VR is, is our deep desire to be in another place. It, it is the source of religion and theater and movies and video games. It is our desire to be in another place, to be present in another place, to be present in another time. And by the way, I think presence is the most powerful quality that VR has. And that is a very different use case, right? Where you have to suspend your disbelief and willingly block out the world the way you block out your living room when you're watching Game of Thrones. But AR is the opposite of that. You need the world. That's what you're augmenting. If you fully occlude it, it is no longer AR. So I think these terms are, are wrongly completed, and there are companies in our business that do that because they want to own brands and they want to own words. Um, you know, got a little out of sync with my slides. So let's go to the world painted with data for a second. Okay, we're looking at the world with our, our mobile phone, and it's going to detect markers, and ultimately it's going to find geolocated content like Pokemon Go, but it's going to be appended to social media. So your social media posts suddenly are free from the tyranny of the newsfeed, right? Because if you take a picture of your friends in this hotel, it will persist there until your other friends come looking for it later, or you're in a restaurant and you leave pictures of your food or a review. So it doesn't go by in your newsfeed and get seen by eight people. It gets seen in context when it's needed. And that just-in-time quality of AR um, is just being developed today. Um, Matt talked a little bit about the AR cloud, but that's where all this content lives, in the cloud waiting to be retrieved by users. So. Um, the visual internet will be built for smartphones, right? U ultimately, the world will be painted in da with data, and ultimately, a head-mounted display will probably be, although not necessarily, will be the way that we access that data, and smartphones are where it's starting. That said, there are many modes of AR, and again, this is an area where there's a lot of confusion, so I'm going to sort of try and bring a little bit of rationality to it. Um, there are a lot of different methods of doing AR. Some of that, most of them, the ones that are really making the big money and are helping companies like Boeing save tens of millions of dollars um, building a jet, each jet. They make 2,000 of them a year. So you can imagine you save $10 million 
2,000 2, times you're talking about real money. And then when people say AR is making billions, that's what we're talking about. And what kind of AR is it? It's you know Google Glass 2.0. It's a little micro screen that hangs out in front of your eyes. It's incredibly annoying. But if you had spent your day looking back and forth at a schematic or at a PC while you were doing complex handwork and wiring, it, it's exhausting and it is mistake prone work. And AR changes that. The, the humble, annoying little micro display changes that and workers love them. And they're, not only do they work faster and better, but the number of mistakes go down. And if you talk to anybody in, in uh, mechanical engineering, the biggest problem is manufacturing mistakes. They are just humans. The most intricate and important parts are done by humans. Yes, a machine can stick the parts where they're supposed to go, but humans have to connect them, and humans make a lot of mistakes at the end of the day with a complicated process. So AR is changing that uh, for the better. Um, but it isn't a consumer device. As soon as they're done, they take it off. It's like a fireman's helmet, right? The fire is over, they get back in their truck, they take the helmet off. So um, tied to this idea of, um, of the persistent placement of data, um, I just want to mention this in passing. The smartphone is a terrible form factor, right? You walk around like this, you look up, you're constantly interrupting um, your presence in the real world. So, and of course, uh, holding your phone up like this and letting it be your little window into a mixed reality world uh, is a terrible form factor, right? I mean, how long can you hold your arm up like this? So it does make, at some point, when AR really becomes an important part of mobile computing, and it is not yet, it's just beginning. Um, but as that form factor starts to become necessary, it will become incredibly annoying, and, and people will seek other solutions. That one is kind of a crazy one. Uh, in the meantime, before we get to a true combiner, magic leap, HoloLens kind of AR with, with, by the way, the form factor has to be like this. Right, it has to be your regular prescription, and it has to be stylish, or people aren't going to wear them. So that's that's you know something that AR has to solve, um, and and it's being solved. But as I said, these these things take decades. Anybody expecting that we're going to be walking around wearing AR glasses in ten years is kidding themselves. It is really not possible, and most of the technology needed to make that possible has not yet been invented. So we're going to get lots of interim devices. Um, you know, we see a bunch of the uh, available AR HMDs. Some are uh, targeted toward consumers. They are suboptimal. Uh, and some of these enterprise devices, um, you know, they do one job really well. Somebody told me, I spend all my time talking to really smart people. I actually have no genuine original thoughts. Uh, I just get to interview a lot of people. And uh, somebody told me, and I wish I could remember, it may have been Brian Ballard from Upskill, that uh, in enterprise, AR is a switchblade. It needs to do one thing. It's designed to do one thing really well. But for consumers, uh, using your cell phone as an example, it's a Swiss Army knife. It's a phone, it does messaging, it's your computer. It, you know, it's gotta do anything you want. It's gotta be a compass, it's gotta give maps. It's, you know, whereas an enterprise doesn't have that challenge. It just needs to do one thing really well. It helps you wire that jet. Uh, just wanted to mention, because we were talking about confusion, um, glasses that take video are not augmented reality glasses. Um, we are going to see a lot of micro displays. Here's Copen's um, shot at putting them out for performance athletes. Uh, yeah. Uh, hasn't, hasn't, uh, taken over the world. Uh, do want to talk about this. I just got to spend 15 minutes with one. It is quite an amazing device. It is a true combiner where it, it, it is able to anchor augmented reality convincingly um, in space with a pretty natural um, headset on. It really is pretty comfortable. We, I have no idea if the Magic Leap is going to work. None of us know if consumers want this. In fact, there's ample evidence to the contrary. Um, 
which is something that every truly original entrepreneur has had to go up against. So this could be, you know, like general magic in the 90s. You know, they invented the smartphone before people were using personal computers at home, before people were using email. So nobody understood what the smartphone could do. So Magic Leap has a huge challenge, but meanwhile, they're doing us all a huge service because they spend hundreds of millions of dollars talking about AR to people. And so that is to our benefit. They are popularizing this idea of wearable contextual computing, uh, which is the holy grail of augmented reality, right? A camera that sees, uh, a camera that's clickable, a camera that can retrieve, uh, ambient, can, can retrieve ambient data and actually alert you to its use. Um, and it doesn't give you irrelevant information, it is contextual. So, it, so, for example, it doesn't show you every picture that got left in a restaurant by your friends, it will show you people in your social graph. Or you might follow a celebrity and they may put content all over the place. Um, in terms of AR glasses, I think we'll start to see some real competition in a couple of years. There's rumors that Apple has something. Uh, we should talk about Apple for a second just because everyone is obsessed with their plans, which as usual are shrouded in secrecy. Um, my prediction for Apple is AR for them is like the iPod to the iPhone 10, right? They're not going to take a moonshot that is going to blow up and kill everybody. They're going to come out with a device, possibly a game device, but a device that does one thing really well, like an iPod. And then they're going to start iterating on that device. So it's not like Apple's going to show up and you're going to say, oh my god, Apple, it's just like my regular glasses, thank you, no. It's going to be some... I mean, if you look at an iPod today, I don't know if you've seen one recently, but they're tremendously lunky. They're really heavy. You know, we used to think the form factor of the iPod was perfect. You know, but really today, if you look at it, it's quite clunky. And so I think that's where we're headed with Apple. I'm very skeptical, skeptical about 2020, actually, so I should update that slide. Um, but the cash is really in our hands. It's, it's the smartphone that we're already using that is going to make things we're already doing much better. And we're seeing it. Google Maps is introducing um, their uh, new navigation uh, in early 2019. Uh, and that will be true AR, geolocated, characters anchored in place showing you the way um, to the subway or through a city. Uh, and it's hopefully going to be amazing. But people are not going to say, oh my god, Google AR Maps are amazing. No, they're going to say, Google Maps, did you see the new Google Maps? They're much, much better. Um, so it's going to become, you know, it's going to slowly seep into our lives, right? There's not going to be a big event, right? But before we know it, AR is going to be um, infiltrating every aspect of mobile computing. The story with VR... Um, is simpler and the road for VR is harder. Because I know what AR could do, and I can explain to people how AR will improve their lives. VR, much more abstract. The killer apps for VR, we all stood here. I would, if I had spoken here a year ago or two years ago, I would have said, well, when the cheap standalone headsets come along, I mean, then VR is really going to break through. Oh, and the headset's $200. Oh, then VR is going to really break through. No, that was wrong. It isn't related to the price, and it's only slightly related to the form factor. The problem with VR is that it has no readily apprehensible consumer value proposition. So people know what VR is, and they try it out in public places, and maybe they've even used it at work. But like the personal computer in 1990, they have no idea why they would have one at home or what it's for. If VR is not a game machine, people do not know what it's for. So it could take, take a while. I, I like to say they're waiting for their AOL moment, right? They're waiting for 1994 where people have a big aha, and they're like, OK, now I understand why I need a $2,000 computer in my house, which you know, would have been like $3,000 today, which is more money than people want to spend uh, on anything except for a car. Um, so the money is being made in enterprise. Again, consumer mobile AR is starting. And it's going to be amazing, but nobody is making any money with that any, today. And it's not like Google's going to improve maps and, and make more money from maps. Um, but in enterprise, it's making a huge difference. So uh, make some quick predictions. I'm a little over time, so I'll make some quick predictions about um, 
the things that are going to happen. Uh, we talked about the invisible data layer and the explosive growth of enterprise. Um, we may see bigger screens. You know, you see the foldable phones that are coming with bigger screens. Um, those bigger screens are going to make mobile AR much better. Um, as I said, I think the adoption of HMDs is going to mirror the um, development pattern of the personal computer. And if that's true, this is 1992. The good news about 1992 is the people in the computer business in 1992 were rich by 2000. Everybody involved got rich in those eight years. So you are sitting in a very good place right now because this is the largest wealth creation opportunity since the internet. Um, I never thought I would see another event like that in my lifetime. Smartphones somewhat uh, uh, were also an incredible opportunity, but this is the next one and you are here. So, um, June 2018, no, that's an old slide, forget that slide. All right, book signing at three o'clock, stop by and say hello, free $50 books, thank you Y Dreams, thank you VRARA, and thank you all for listening to me this afternoon.